He called them. And they were, what were they doing? They were doing something. They were there to make profit. Those are the things that God looks at. When he's looking for people to work, he's not looking for lazy bums. He's looking for people who can do stuff at a high level. And when you look at fishermen, man, they spend the whole day. The biggest virtue when you're doing fishing, you have to be patient over a long period of time. And you must be expecting disappointment because you might cast your nets and nothing comes up. You will find that discipleship is mentioned over 500 times in the scriptures. Because it is the making of the fishers of men. It is the way God trains you. It's where God equips you to be a full-fledged Christian, to be a mature Christian. Maturity is determined in the discipleship process. The first thing that he tells them, he says, follow me. So they have to leave whatever they do. That's the similar thing. When you come to the kingdom, honey, you have to fo- drop your nets. You have to drop what you know. And when you come into the kingdom, you are just following what the kingdom is saying. You are following what Jesus is saying. Honey, you are following what the word of God is saying. You are not following your own philosophy. But the problem is we don't want to follow. We, want, we still want to drag our nets. We still want to do our own thing. He says, follow me and I will make you. You see, there is a making part in our journey with the Lord. Uh, today, we, we, we're going to be talking about, um, uh, a, uh, it's not a series, but it's just uh, a sermon uh, that we're going to be talking about. Uh, the title is Fishers of Men. Um, so we, we're just going to talk about it just to encourage the, the brethren uh, and to just to admonish them uh, in terms of us uh, continually, you know, making the main thing the main thing. And that is obviously, you know, uh, preaching the gospel and talking to people about our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Um, I, I hope we... we, we, we We'll be able to finish, uh, you know, because I, there, there might be some I- interruptions along the way, in a good manner. Amen. Matthew chapter number four, starting from verse eighteen. <laughs> um, thank you, Spirit of the Living God. Um, you know, it's it's one of those things that um, you know. Uh, okay, maybe let's read. I, I'm just trying to gather my thoughts and trying to see how we can, you know, start. But anyway, it is well. It says, and Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, right? And saw two brethren. You know, uh, one thing I've, I have learned to understand now when you are a Bible student is everything that is in text or in Scripture is there for a reason. There is a revelation behind it. Everything that you find in the text is there for a reason. He's, he's, he's walking by the Sea of Galilee and he sees two brothers from the same family. He sees what? Two brothers, two brothers from the what? Same That's profound. That is profound. That is profound. And Jesus is calling these brothers. I thought maybe he would have called one. But he calls them. He calls a family structure. He calls a family structure. And that's why it's very important, even in our endeavor, in our, in our journey, to make sure that our families and our loved ones are not left behind. Because many a times, where there is a place where God, in his wisdom, has said this is the place of worship for this particular family. This is the place that they are going to do their assignments. It's not just biological. It's not just biological, brother. There is many a times there are spiritual connotations to yeah. that. There are callings that are aligned yeah. to your brothers, your own siblings. Many a time. You will find family is critical in ministry. Very critical. He calls two brothers. 
and he says, he calls them, right? Called, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were what? For they were fishers. They were fishermen. And you look, these brothers, they had a family business. These were business people. They were doing something when they met Jesus. They were not just, you know, chilling. They were doing something. Jesus went into the marketplace and found people who were doing stuff. Those are the people he associated himself with, fishermen. He called them. And they were, what were they doing? They were doing something. They were there to make profit. Those are the things that God looks at. When he's looking for people to work, he's not looking for lazy bums. He's looking for people who can do stuff at a high level. And when you look at fishermen, man, they spend the whole day. The biggest virtue when you're doing fishing, you have to be patient over a long period of time. And you must be expecting disappointment because you might cast your nets and nothing comes out. So he wasn't just taking people. <laughs> so it's strategic. He was looking. He didn't look for a carpenter. He, was lo he looked for people who were patient, who were able to use bait. They put their bait and then they have a loss and nothing comes out. Tomorrow they are coming back again and they are saying, we are doing this thing again. He's looking for people who he can walk with over a long period of time. Who have endurance. When you're doing future, you're dealing with high waters. You're dealing with weathers. You're dealing with waves. With all kinds of stuff. And those are the people he begins. These are the first people he calls into ministry. So when you are walking with God, God doesn't just take any, any jello person. Kingdom is not for jello people. Kingdom is for people who have a strong backbone, who are willing to, to wait. Because there's, there's so much waiting. You can wait for eight hours with no catch. Remember when you read the story, when he met them, they had toiled what? All night. They pulled an all-nighter. They did not take it personally. They were not bitter. They were willing again to come. I'm just, I'm just talking of one trait. One trait of a fisherman. And he said, and he said unto them, follow me. I will make you, verse 19, I will make you fishers of men. The first thing that he tells them, he says, follow me. So they have to leave whatever they do. That's the similar thing. When you come to the kingdom, honey, you have to drop your nets. You have to drop what you know. And when you come into the kingdom, you are just following what the kingdom is saying. You are following what Jesus is saying. Honey, you are following what the word of God is saying. You are not following your own philosophy. But the problem is we don't want to follow. We, want, we still want to drag our nets. We still want to do our own thing. He says, follow me and I will make you. You see, there is a making part in our journey with the Lord. He says, I will make you. So it means that when he called them, he knew that they were not done. They were not ready. He says, I will make you fishers of men. What is he referring to? He says, I will make you disciples. You will be able now to be able to become fishers of men, to be able to be disciples. So when you get born again, when you get born again and you accept Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior, most of the churches, that's where they end. We just look at hell insurance. That's what we focus on. Let's get them in. Let's get them in. We get them in, then we do what? That's why you find most of the believers, they are, they are, they are afraid, they are worried, they are anxious like non-believers. They don't believe. Like the, the, the early church that we find in the book of Acts. They are not, we are, the caliber, when you look at the Christians of today, they don't have the, 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 the right caliber. They don't have the right philosophy. They don't have the right heart and convictions pertaining to the gospel. Because why? People just went in. They did that prayer and that was it. And they were allowed to gallivant, do their own thing. He says, follow me. This is a divine instruction. It's an imperative. They are living everything that they know to do. And they are following him. They have no choice. It's a command. So we will find in the church, we think it's democracy. We are not told what to do. When we tell you life group is a must, no. Why are they making life group a must? No, you have to follow. There's a system. Because Jesus knows that they are not cooked yet. They are not cooked yet. There's a time he told follow. There's a time he says go. Do whatever you have to do. Because he knows. He knew that they were ready. 
He knew that they were ready. He says, go and do whatever you have to do. But at the time they had to follow, he says, I will make you. When you are making stuff, there are ingredients that you have to put to make something. There are things that environments or systems that you have to put. He says, I will make you fishers of men. Right? And straight away they left their nets. They what? Immediately. Immediately. Agency. They left their nets and followed him. And going from thence, he saw two what? Ah, come on, man. He saw two what? He saw another family. It's not by coincidence. That's why even in Glorious, you find that people bring their siblings here. And they are growing here. It's not by coincidence. No, just say it's not, it was not a good idea. It's a God idea. It's a God idea because God knows that for this family to have deliverance, for it to do stuff, they have to be in a specific spiritual location where they will be fed, where they will abide. Because God knows you. He knows the best place for you. He says he met what? Two brethren again, the sons of Zebedee. You saw the mother even followed them at some point in time. And he was trying to negotiate. <laughs> Mothers, they are special. <coughs> he was trying to negotiate for them. But you see, the whole family came. Even Simon Peter, the mother-in-law had an issue. They were consistently in relationship with the ministry of Jesus. He says, he follow, he says and he says, and they went to with two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. What were they doing? They were busy. They were doing again something. They were mending their what? means that the nets might have been broken. So he's able to see that these people, they can mend people. They can heal broken hearts, these people. If they can take time to be so meticulous with nets, definitely I can use them. Says in their, their, their father, right? And immediately, and he called, and, and mending their nets, and he called them. And immediately they left the ship and their father, and they followed him. If it was us leaving your own dead, how dare you? How dare you leave your own dead to follow this church, to follow this thing? This church is a cult. How dare you do that? You abandon family. No, they are not abandoning family. They are, they are prioritizing what's important. Our relationship and the calling that God has given us is the most important thing. This thing, listen, <laughs> in heaven, they won't really care what you did. They really want to know what did you do with the gospel. Yeah. That's the most important thing. Whether you send groceries as well, at home, it's a good thing. If you are supposed to do that. But at heaven, people, when they get prizes, I have to be real with you. They are going to be looking, what did you do for the advancement of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ? Finish and clear, not other things. That's what they want to look at. That's what they are concerned about. Apostle Paul says, Woe unto me if I don't preach the gospel. It says necessity. Necessity has been laid upon me to preach the gospel. It's a vital important part of the agenda of God in the earthly realm. Winning souls for our Lord Jesus Christ. So you can't be in God's agenda. You can't be part of the church of a local community, local church, without you participating in the discipleship of nations, in the winning of souls. Every person in the kingdom of God has to have a place, has to have their fingerprint on making sure that souls are one. You do that by you doing soul winning. You do that by you making sure that you give for the gospel. If you can't talk, let your money talk. That, that's important. Th those are the key things. I have to be, we just have to be real with each other. We are not the church for just saying, oh, you know, we have, a, we have an evangelist. The evangelist is going to do this. Even if we have an evangelist, guys, at the end of the day, when you check out of this world, you are going to be standing. There's going to be a white throne judgment where you are going to be standing before Jesus and he's going to look at your works and he's going to see what did you do, you as an individual? What was your contribution? 
So you can't go there with nothing. You can't go there with what? You have to do something. You have to contribute, man. You have to contribute. Because others will be receiving crowns. I don't know what the ones who didn't do nothing. I don't know what they'll be doing. Whether you get small marbles, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what you what, what you will get. But you better get something for Jesus. Young people, are you hearing what I'm saying? Yeah. Students, are you hearing what I'm saying? Yeah. It's very important. So church is not just ah, we are just going to church. We are doing, you know, oceans, you know, spirit lead me, That's those things we do, those things, but there is an assignment. And it's not for preachers. It's not for what? Yeah, the problem you think is for preachers and the evangelists. Vangeli, those are the ones. Just leave that thing to those people so that they do. No, 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 no. You have a responsibility as a child of God. You have a what? You have a responsibility. So that's very important. Let's go to Romans chapter number 1, verse 16. So, it says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It says, I am not ashamed of the what? Gospel. I... Many a times, you know, I know sometimes there's some form of shame when you're at campus and, you know, people, you don't really want people to know that you are born again. You know, you just want to be a cool kid of the week, you know, you know, just chilling and whatever. I will tell you there's going to be a time where you really, really want to, you know, be part of the gospel. So you shouldn't be ashamed. So I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. You shouldn't be ashamed of the gospel. You should be proud of the gospel. When they read the term gospel, they refers good news. Too good to be true. Too good to be true. That Jesus would die for us. And would forgive us of our sins. Past present and future. This is, this is what they say, too good to be true news. That's what the gospel comes. It's too good to be true. It's un, uh, you don't understand how this news can come out. And this is, this, is, this is one of the things that as believers we shouldn't be ashamed of. Say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. So, it's important as children of God that we know that, you know, one of our callings, um, maybe let's go, let's go to, um, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, uh, starting from verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, starting from verse 18. It says, And all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself. God is what? Has reconciled. It's God who's doing. It's not really you. It's God who's doing the reconciliation. When you're referring to reconciliation, it's God who mediates. Is the one who mediates uh, uh, us to himself. He's the one who says, no, we are good now. We are fine now. You are forgiven, right? Through what? Through our acceptance of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who reconciles us to say, you no, know, man, I want to have a relationship with you uh, and I love you. This is when you were even sinners, before you even knew that you needed to, to get born again. He says, God did that with his love. He says, who has reconciled us to, uh, by himself, uh, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Right? So it is Jesus Christ. When Jesus came and he died for us, and then the reconciliation happened with God. We are now on the good side of God. Right, 
And he says he has, so when we have been reconciled uh, uh, to God, it means that we are in good books with God. We are in good books with what? He is the one who in his love, he has decided to say, you know what? I want to have a relationship with these guys and I want, I love them and I want us to be in good books. He is the one who does the mediation. He does the settlement between us and him. He pays the, the price that needed to be uh, paid. That is the wages of sin. That is death. And then Jesus dies and then we have been reconciled to us. And when we are doing reconciliation, it's really love. I think this nation, you understand <laughs> truth and reconciliation, where people set aside their what? Their issues, their differences, and they say, you know what, listen, let's love on one another. Let's make this relationship work. And we are being told that it's God who has reconciled us to, him by, uh, to himself by Jesus Christ, right? And he has given to us the ministry. He has given us the what? So he has given us the ministry now of reconciliation. So all of us, that's what I'm referring to, that all of us, because we have been forgiven, we have been loved and been given, we are now been given a ministry of reconciliation. So that's where we get the term ministers of the gospel or ministers of reconciliation. We are now the one reconciling people who are not born again to say, hey, you need to get born again. You know God loves you, so I'm here. So all of us are ministers. You're honorable members. You're in the cabinet of heaven, right? He says he has, he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So in, you are in, the, in heaven, you are in the department of what? Reconciliation in the works of Jesus Christ. So that's the department you are in, if you didn't know. Let's go to the next verse. He puts those, you see that before that, he puts those dots, right? And he says, to wit, so obviously, what is the reconciliation? It's not just um, uh, 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 re, uh, knowing that you have been reconciled. There is a word of reconciliation. It says, to wit, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. And he has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. What is the word? That God is not angry with you. He's not imputing sin upon you. God loves you. So that is one of the things that we are supposed to be, um, you know, doing when we meet our loved ones, when we meet people, we are telling them that God actually loves them. Hallelujah. Let's go to the next verse. Right? He says, now then, we are ambassadors. You see? He use, he's using political statements. He says, now we are ambassadors for Christ. What is an ambassador? It's someone who represents a certain kingdom in another kingdom. We are an ambassador. So you are an ambassador. For what? For Jesus Christ. You represent Jesus Christ here on earth. What Jesus would want to do here on earth, you are the one who fulfills that mandate. If there is healing that needs to be done, you are the one who does that. If there is comfort that needs to be done, you are the one who has to do it. He says, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead that you be reconciled to God. So we, we, we just need to know that as much as God has reconciled himself to us, you have to have the understanding that you have been reconciled to God. You need to know you are loved, you are forgiven. I'm an ambassador. I have a ministry of reconciliation. Wherever I go, I'm in the business of winning souls for Jesus. So it's for everyone. It's for what? Every believer of Jesus Christ must be able to preach the gospel to any other person and should be able to disciple them. So we're going to go here now to, to Matthew chapter number uh, 28. Let's, let's maybe start from verse... Uh, Maybe let's start from verse 17. Matthew chapter number 28, starting from verse 17. And he says, and they saw him. So this is the Jesus who is now resurrected. He is appearing to the disciples. And obviously they are seeing him for the first time. And he says, and when they saw him, they washed him, but they some doubted. Obviously, they were not really sure. There's always doubt. They are worshiping and they still doubt even in, in people doing that. Let's go to the next verse. And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, O power 
All power has been what? Given to him. Why is he saying that? Because remember, during before his death, Satan had the keys of death. Because he had we had lost dominion and power in Genesis when they ate of the fruit. So now he's coming now to say all power right, is given unto me in heaven and in what? In earth. So he has given us what? Power. So we have power there. We have, we, we, we have the power from the... Uh, uh, this is Jesus saying he has power. Let's go. He's going to delegate this power, right? He says, go ye therefore. So he says, all power from heaven and earth has been given unto me. He then says, go ye therefore. So we are going in what? In the power that he has spoken about. Right. Put it in the NIV. He says, therefore go and make disciples. He says, go and what? He says, go. First of all, the term go, they is to go and win them. Go and evangelize to them. Once you win them, there has to be a system where people are discipled. So discipleship is very important. When we win souls, we should know that we have a responsibility of discipling them. It's a system that Jesus said. You will find that discipleship is mentioned over 500 times in the scriptures. Because it is the making of the fishers of men. It is the way God trains you. It's where God equips you to be a full-fledged Christian, to be a mature Christian. Maturity is determined in the discipleship process. That's why we always have this mantra. We are not in the business of just filling up space. We, we do, it's not about filling up space. It's about filling up strategy. Our strategy is we have to become disciples. We must have a system. We must have people who are trained, who are developed, who know that they are disciples. But if we just hoard people, we just bring people, and they are not disciples. They are just converts. There is a difference between those two. Converts are the people who are just born again. They don't have any form of responsibility in the kingdom. They don't know their calling. They don't know why they are here. They just come, they sing the first songs, they sing the strong songs, and then they go out. They don't know who, what, what is it all about. But it's in the process of discipleship that you are able now to able to develop and grow up. That's where you, you grow up in the things of God. You know what the kingdom is all about. So you see, he says, go and make disciples. Make disciples. Put it in the King James Version. You see, go ye therefore and teach. Go ye therefore and what? There has to be teaching. There has to be systematic teaching for people to grow. You just, when you are giving a child, my little one who's great, I just don't say today I give a milk, tomorrow I give a bones, tomorrow I just give whatever, jello, I just, no. When the child is growing, they will tell you, this one, you give milk from this age to this age. You start from solids from this age to this age. It's systematic growth. Systematic growth. You just, I just don't say that I, I think pizza is good for her. Let me just give her pizza. No. There has to be growth. Systematic teaching. That's why you find that we are saying we are doing seriously. Listen, honey. If I want, if we wanted, we could have been doing many sermons. Today we are talking about this. No, 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 no. We do systematic teaching where it's series format. Series format is systematic. The Bible talks about that. It says line upon line. Precept upon precept. That's how it works. That's how you, are, you grow in the things of God. It's not just giving you today. Today I've given you pudding, jelly, tomorrow meat. No, no, no. It shouldn't be like that. It's not a buffet. It's one meal. You are just constantly you are being reminded the word of God. You find everything, it comes back the word of God. 
Everything comes back to the word of God. That's how it should be. That's how you're going to be growing. That's how children grow. For you to grow, they were not just, they were giving you the same thing over a long period of time until they started seeing growth yeah. in you. They started seeing you develop certain muscles. They say, like, oh, okay, maybe we can alter it. But Oksala, you, there are still meals that they will tell you. These meals you still continue, you still maintain for your growth. Says, let's teach disciples. We were reading about it in the Old Testament. It says they couldn't do much because they didn't have a teaching priest. They didn't have a teaching priest. They didn't have a teaching priest. People need to be taught. And you must, be, you must know that you also must be willing to learn. You must be willing to what? There's always something to learn. If you avail yourself. The problem is we think we know. That's the problem. We think we know. So it's very important that we, 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 we develop as a church in discipleship. That is our key thing. I don't waste my time, people who are not disciples. I don't waste my time. I don't waste my time. I don't waste my time at all. I don't care what problem you have. It's not going to help you. It's not going to help you. If you are not discipled, it's not going to help you. It's the converts who are always looking for a miracle to a miracle. They are looking for a service to a service. They are looking for a prophet to prophet. They go profit shopping. Prophet shopping. Church shopping. They are looking. They are looking for a place where someone can put them, lay hands on them and doing whatever. Even if those prophets lay hands on you, that word has to be cultivated. It must be natured for it to come to manifest. Because the Bible says we war with prophecy. The problem is we don't want that. Because we are a microwave generation. We are looking now what's the prophetic word. We want someone to induce that. We are always looking for miracles. Question. How many miracles did Jesus perform for the disciples? How many? Answer me. How many miracles did he perform? Did he perform many major miracles for the disciples? What was he spending his time? He spent time teaching them in parables. Teaching them in lectures. That's what he spent time doing. The miracles were there for the people. The miracles were He never did something for them. He was spent time teaching them, teaching them. But the problem is, it's the church of today where we want miracle services. We will have them, but we will not grow. We will not grow to the place that the Spirit of God would want the church to grow. The, ch ch the Spirit of God would want the church to be at a certain level. When they hear their talk, when they say, these people, they have filled this whole land with their doctrine. Says these ones have come to turn the city upside down. When the term Christians was because they were Christ-like. That's what the term. <coughs> it's only mentioned once. They were Christ-like. They spoke like Christ. They demonstrated the power of God like Jesus. They were Christ-like. That's what the Christians mean. It was a very derogatory term, but it became, you know, the, the highest form of honor where people looked at them and they could identify Jesus in them. That's how it should be. That's how church should be. And we are, all of us, we are in a journey. I have to become a disciple. I have to grow to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. We were being told we are ambassadors. How can you be an ambassador? Will you know nothing when you are acting like a civilian? Because you should be able to represent the country. And you should be confident that you are an ambassador for Christ. That's the thing. That if you were to be crucified for being a Christian, would they have enough evidence to convict you? 
will there be enough evidence? Because they are not sure. Because there is nothing that you have that really shows that you are a Christian. Nothing. So we have to grow. So you see, that's what discipleship does. Disciples, they put priority. They put a premium on the word of God. That's how you find. And they are faithful. They are available. They are teachable. They value the things of God. Disciples. Not what we are seeing now in a generation where people want to live outside the confinement of discipleship systems. Where people just say, we are doing stuff. We are doing, a, we are doing stuff. And then they do stuff. They do their stuff online. They do a, a meeting. And those people are not, disi- are not disciples. There are things that are springing up in this country where they just go to universities. Who is going to disciple those people? Where are you putting those people? Those people are important because many a times those people, are, when, when Satan will come for those people and they'll be far worse because the church we, we want, the thing is we are so big with crowds. We think ministry is, is growth based on crowds. We think that's how we measure growth in ministry. We don't measure, let me tell you, we don't measure growth in ministry based on the crowd and the number of the church. We measure ministry based on the transformed lives. Yeah. When you meet a person from this church, you should be able to know this is a person who is serious about the yeah. things of God. That's how you measure transformation. That's how you measure growth. Not based on the crowds. Jesus had 12 people. He had a church of 12 people. That's the people that he had. If we were to judge him, what would you be saying? What would you be saying? But look at the, how those 12 people affected the whole world. So that's very important, that when we are doing things, yes, we are going to grow. I mean, we are going to grow, and it's great, and whatever. Our numbers are growing, but it should never be the focus. Yeah. Yeah. I, when they were, I, th- I think in the expansion, they were telling me, we need to look for another venue. I said, how many life groups do we have? We don't move because we, are, we, have, we have overflow. We move when we have many life groups. That's how we move. Yeah. We look for another venue based on our life groups, the disciples. I don't, I'm not here for, for converts. I'm here for disciples. Those are the people we focus because we know that here we can plan. <laughs> if you are to look for expensive venue, at least with disciples, we know we can plan. The, the, the DNA people, I can plan with them. Not these other people. I can't plan with those people. So I don't know how far they will go. So that's very important. When we are looking for growth, when we are looking for growth, look at disciples. Same thing when you're looking for a spouse. Are they a disciple? Don't waste your time. I go to church. It's not enough. Satan also goes to church. The Bible says demons, they believe and they tremble. Do you find them there? They are there that who come and pray on the liberty of the brethren. The Bible says beware of dogs. They are talking in the church. There are people who know that we are going to get the sisters because the sisters are lamp, they are sheep. They are gullible. They are innocent. People come there and they will act for a season that they are people of God. Masquerading themselves as ministers of light and they are ministers of darkness. So it's not just because church you just lose your God. Are they disciples? You check. Where are they? The disciples just seem, you can't cheat it. You can't. You are there. You see this person is in a space. They are in a community. They are growing. They are doing these things. They are faithful, available, and teachable. Then you can say at least we can have coffee. We can have coffee at least. <laughs> yes. We, now we can't make the mistakes of what our mom and dad you know, did. We can't make those mistakes. Where they just, now we met at a church and you see this person after, I've heard situations where after the wedding day, the person just says, I just came here for you. They go back to the world. And this was a fervent sister who was so passionate about the person. We have seen these things over the years. Yes. So you're not going to make those mistakes? No. Hallelujah. It says, go and make disciples. It's only the disciples who, who value the teaching ministry. They value the teaching ministry. They are not there for the entertainment. They value, not to say the other ministries are not important, but the base in the foundation is teaching. A teaching priest. Israel could not go far. They did not have a teaching priest. Teaching. 
teaching, learning. They used to call him rabbi. They never used to call him prophet. They used to call him who? Rabbi. Yes. They used to call him rabbi. They would call him rabbi. They, because they were, they, they were students of the school of Jesus. That's where they spent their time in doing. They used to call him rabbi. So we are not here to, to just, you know, bring, you know, as, as the clergy, to just bring motivational speaking. No, 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 no. It has to be systematic teaching. Line upon line. Precept. And we are saying the, thing, the same thing over a long period of time. Look at the, even look at the parables. They are just talking about the same thing. And so on, so on, so on. Like, ah, Baba, don't you have other sermons? <laughs> He's just the sower. He's talking about the farming. The seed. Sower seed. Everywhere seed. No, 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 no. It's, we, that's what we are to, talking about. Systematic teaching. Systematic teaching. There has to be a value on the word of God. These are the things we will follow. It says, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Baptizing them. What does he do? He brings an element of baptism. There must be a demonstration of the spirit of God. So he introduces the teaching them, disciple them, the presence of God, the Holy Ghost. You will find again there are churches who don't believe in the Holy Ghost. Of which the scriptures are what? Are clear. The scriptures are clear. They don't believe in the speaking of tongues. You hear us announcing all the time. If you want to receive the Bible, it's important. Well, the apostles, every time they would meet someone, they would not even proceed. That's the first thing. Did you receive the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they would ask, which Holy Ghost? No, we just received the baptism of water. And says, no, we need to talk about the Holy Ghost. They make sure that everyone is tongue-talking. Because if you are not in that level, these things of teaching, you, it needs a specific frequency. It needs a what? Yes, because the Holy Ghost is the one who unveils the scriptures. Is the what? Is the Holy Ghost who unveils them? He's a revelator. So revelation comes to you, not by flesh and blood, but by the Spirit. So we are in the business of revelation. We are in the business of what? It's it. You are just. You see, that's what we solicit here for. When we open the scriptures, we are looking for revelation. Because Re Revelation is the one that ushers us into what God wants, has for us. Into the places and the platforms of grace. Revelation. It helps us when, when something has been revealed to you. It changes your mindset. It changes your philosophy. It deals with your issues, your fears, your worries, your anxieties. It's Revelation. When it has dawned in the quarters of your heart. But how does it happen? It's not like some, the situation that you're going through has changed. No. You receive a rhema word from God. When you receive a rhema word, the word, the Spirit of God just changes all the dynamics of the contents of your soul. Suddenly there's no fear. It's not like the situation has changed. But for that situation to change, it starts from here. So that's why the Spirit of God has to bring that download in the inside of you. Then once you have changed... There's no more fear, no more worry. You find situations now have changed. So the, that's why I said baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Very important. So you will find that there are churches who don't prioritize this thing. And they just think church is just a society where we wear the same uniform and we play songs and we do whatever. No, that's not it. That's not it. Say discipleship. Let's go to the next verse. It says teaching them. You, you, you see, uh, it's, it's, uh, they are, they are, they are, you find teaching is, is an, they, it keeps on being hammered. Teaching them to observe. To observe what? Yes, yes you have to teach them. So that's why we put systems to say you have to be in a life group. You have to be serving. You can't be serving if you're not in a life group. We are putting systems. We have to teach people. Because human tendency tends to relax. 
teaching them to observe all things. In any society, you will find that for you, even in the military, you just don't do things that you want. They know for you to be an effective soldier. There are systems that they will tell you, we are not going home for this period from the time you start, you're not going home. You're not doing this. What are they? Those are systems to discipline you, to train you, to equip you to become the best version. Because they know that if you are busy, always, you know, always amongst the civilians, you will think that you're a civilian. And the enemy can take advantage of you. That's why you find that they are separated from the rest of the world. Yes. You are soldiers in the army of God. You are, there has to be a separation. There has to be a what? A, yes. How are you going to affect the world? How are you going to, when, you are, you, are, when you, are, you are just normal, you're like a civilian, and you entangle, that's what Paul says, says don't entangle yourselves in the affairs of civilians. You are busy. You are always checking what's trending. You are always, you are busy. You are all over, you are all over the place. No, man. It says, teaching them to observe all things. Whatsoever I have commanded you. You see the terms. They are very, imagine, they are telling you what to do. They are telling grown men. He is telling grown men. But the problem is we don't want to be told. When we tell you guys, attend life group. If you don't attend life group, we are removing you from the group. We are chucking you out. Like, yo, this church now. Ah, you know. No, we know. We know that if we are not strict, you would take it for granted. But when you, we are strict, you will see value. When you go, they're like, oh, they, this thing is not guaranteed. They get, they get, these people are crazy. <coughs> Since I've, <coughs> I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. That consciousness that when we win souls, we know that God is with you, even unto the end of the world. Thank you. Let's go to... Um, so, so, so it, it's very important because when we get born again, we are not, we, we, we are in the process of developing to become the individuals that God wants us to be. So that's why in discipleship is important. You are still half baked, you are not fully cooked. So you have to appreciate that. You have to what? All right. Let me show. Let's go to Proverbs chapter number 23, verse 26. I want you to look at this story. Proverbs chapter number 23, verse 26. So we have to know that we are growing. We are renewing our minds. We are growing. We have to become disciples. We are, the discipleship process is very important. So we value discipleship. I can tell someone's success if they are in a life group. If they are I can. I don't need anything. I just know this person is gonna do well. Even when we, I was growing as a Christian, the people who were disciples, they are still disciples today. The people who were tomfoolering with disciples, they are still tomfoolering with life. It just happens. There is something about being in a system, being in a place of community where you grow, and there are many impartations that do happen there, many graces that do happen there. When you are that person. He says, do you see? So we, uh, you would agree with me that the moment you get born again, you become a child of God. Agreed. You are a son in the kingdom of God. But you see here, he says, my son. This is someone who is a child of God. He says, my son, give me thy heart. I thought when you get born again, you automatically give your heart to God. No. He knows that you can be a Christian, but your heart is not still yet there. He says, my son, give me thy heart. He is a son in the kingdom. They are born again. They are tongue talking, but their heart is not yet been fully given to the Lord. And we know we, we have to, if you want to look, if you want to put a tracker on the heart, the Bible says, where your what? 
Yeah. This way, yo, that's where we are. <laughs> yes. He says, give me thy heart. We, we want to track the heart. We look where the treasure is. So for the son to develop and give his heart, we have to track your treasure. What are your affections in the gospel? Does the gospel, are you, is your heart invested in the gospel? Are you concerned when people get born again? Are you concerned that people are not in a life group? Are you concerned that people are not being made disciples? Where is your heart pertaining to the things of the kingdom? Your heart has to be in this thing. It has to be a concern that we have to win people, not just win disciple people. So that's my encouragement to you. Your heart has to be in the gospel. He says, my son, give me thy heart. Let thy eyes observe. It's only when you have given your heart, you have given your everything, you have given your time, you have given your resources, you have given, you have given up your personal convictions and understandings. That's when you start now, your eyes be able now to observe. You'll be able to do the word. But if your heart is not there, you will find that you will struggle to do the word of God. But it's in the process of discipleship where we slowly give our hearts. We slowly what? Yes, it's training for all of us. It's when, like what Pastor P was saying, when you give, you'll be like, yo, I've given this much. No, my heart is changing. The Tate five years ago, he was not going to do this. I was not ever going to do this. Why? You are developing. You are growing. They are growing. You will find that these boys, they started as fishermen. They grew up, they became his disciples. You will find that they grew up, they became apostles. It's always a stage. There is always a growth. But people today, you find someone who says, I'm an apostle. Baba. <laughs> you, just, <laughs> you just, people just say, I'm, a, I'm an apostle. <laughs> you have skipped all the grades. You've, it's like you are going to invest. I'm, I'm a professor. Baba, you, you, have, you have to go through the stages. You can't just be a professor. You have to grow. It's not to say there is, you won't be, but there are processes. There are processes where you are going through and God has to develop you and train you through your adolescence. It's very important. So that, that's, that's the most important thing. Um, let's go to Acts chapter number 11, verse 26. He says, and when he found, um, and when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the what? The whole what? It wasn't flip what? The whole year. You, you, you see, we, the Bible, when it gives you these things, it's trying to tell you. That when you are part of a church, you have to be consistent. You can't always be absent, you know. Yeah, you, in the whole year, you, oh, because, I, guys, it says it came to pass the whole year that, you see, the whole year. They could have said it came to pass in that year. But you see, the whole year, the entirety of the process is important. Don't make it a habit of being absent from church. See, people with the, the whole year, they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people and the disciples, you see? And the what? They are the ones who were there the whole year and they are the ones who were being taught. It says they were called Christians. They what? Don't, don't, yeah, you see who are the Christians. Don't just say, hey, I'm a Christian. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Are you a disciple? Are you a disciple? You, you, are, you, you, are, con you are a convert. Christians are the disciples. The difference. 
You will find that even when they write, they say they added unto them. They, they, didn't, say, they didn't say disciples. They just said them. <laughs> they, they added them because we don't know, because they, they have to be taught. The apostles knew that this person is not cooked. This person is not cooked. This person will be taken advantage of. They have to be cooked in the word. The word has to build them. Faith has to grow. They have to learn to stand in the day of evil. They have to learn they, because they knew. They were first, they were called Christians first in Antioch. They were there the whole year. The disciples. That's what's important. Be a disciple of Jesus Christ. We are not looking for members. Listen. We are not looking for church members. Is Ed Virgin active? Planet Fitness? That's where they are looking for members. That's where they are looking for members. In the burial societies. Those are the people who are looking for members. At church, we don't look for membership. Discipleship. That's very important. So when you go to church, where am I going to church? I, I'm a member. So that, you know, back then people just want when, when, when people, are, when there's a funeral. Oh, that's where... <laughs> When there is a field, that's where people are like, I'm a member of this church. No. Because the disciples are the ones who are vested in the ministry. They're the ones who are what? Listen, if you pass away, I have to be honest with you. If you pass away, you are not in a discipleship. We have no business of attending you. I have to, no, I have to, I have to, I have to just tell you the truth so that you decide, so that you decide. I'm speaking as someone who has gone to bury people who were not disciples, attending to them, being nice, you know, being the coolest pastor, wasting my time in COVID, where I would put my family to risk in COVID. Going and people, and you are thinking, if I help them, if I financially support this family, they will be there. Finding someone I had to Go out of my comfort zone. Find an interpreter. Where to speak? Because uh, I am there now. It's cold. It's doing all kinds of COVID. It's there with masks. I'm doing all kinds of things. And I'm thinking, if I do that, I show myself as the church, we raise money, we give this family. I think these people would definitely love God. It happened the first time. The second time it happened again. I'm like, I think the second time it would, it would then solidify. Those people are no way close to the gospel. I won't waste my time. I won't waste my time. I, who is me? I'm not so powerful that I can convince someone to love God. It's this system. When I see this system, I'll be able to say, this person, we can bank on God. We can bank on God. So I don't waste my time. Ask Sister Kim. We would have church. We had a church Sunday service in our church. We were having pizza every Sunday. <coughs> For free. The whole year. Isn't you reading the whole year? I have a special place in heaven. The whole year, we were feeding the multitudes. Feeding the multitudes. Not just this debonese. This is this one, that the special ones. These special ones in the restaurants. We were forking out the bill for that. The whole year. Live groups, when, when people's birthday, we were ordering woolies cakes. Doing stuff for people. <laughs> Trying, Molata, to say, if we do this, I would go, I would drive myself. I was attending two live groups in a week. I attend on a Wednesday. I attend on a Thursday. Driving from all the way from four ways, going into these places where I could have been hijacked. Going there. <laughs> trying to preach the gospel. Trying to love. I would do bribes for people. What is it that you'd want? Use my own resources. And I'm thinking, no, if I do that, if I look, I'm cool. They would listen to the Caspers. I would be dancing. Hey, hey, sure, sure, no. Hey, hey, doing all of those things. And you are thinking, I'm doing, I'm becoming like all men so that I can win men for Christ. And people would take this thing cheaply. I'm not going to allow Jesus to be taken cheaply. You have to value these things. So when I'm saying this, I'm not just saying this. I'm saying this is someone who has tried it all. I've tried it all. To say, what can we do? 
What can, we, what can I do to you? There's nothing you can do for those people. Nothing. If someone is not in a system, if you are not in a system, we don't have a business. Even in the old churches, they check your con- Where are you? They look, they, they yeah. bring the record books. Yeah. Didn't they do that when, they, when the king, when you read the story of Esther, didn't they do that? Yeah. They says the king could not sleep and says, bring me the records. And see what, who has contributed to this kingdom. Yeah. And Mordecai was found because he was written. He had impact. There was contribution with impact. Yeah. They record things that they do. Even in, in, the, in heaven, there's a book of remembrance. They write stuff. Great thing, but if you are, people just want stuff like a church is like an NGO. It's not like an NGO. You have to contribute. You have to be part of a system. You have to be vested in what they are doing. So that people also can be vested in your things. Yeah. It's only people who are in life group. That's where we see this person is amongst us. That's where we see. That's the only way I could see. And once we have done that here at Glorious, we have never had issues. I never had to try and call people to find, where are you in life group? I haven't tried to, to try and make life group like, a, like, like a, a feeding scheme. Never had to do that. Whether I'm there and I'm not there. If I knew, if I'm not there in life group, there's no life group. If Kim and Carol are not there, there's no life group. How can you do a church of Jesus like that? You can't. It is not like we had few people. We had a multitude of people. People were coming. But Jesus says, I know you are here for the bread. That's what Jesus told them. He says, I know you are here for the bread. So not all the multitude were following Jesus. There were some of them, they had heard the story that, no, last week there was a few loaves and five fish. He fed them. In that other wedding, he has a tendency of turning water into wine. Let's follow this man. So it's the disciples. It's the disciples that people look at. And that's why it's important that we have to become disciples. We shouldn't be burdens. To ministers of the gospel. Most ministers, they don't want to do ministry. But I've always told them, guys, don't waste your time. Life groups. Those are your members. People who are in life groups. That's the truth. You have to know, when you come out, you, I have to be part. If it's not glorious, find a space where you're going to be in a life group, where you're going to be discipled, where you're going to be growing there. That is the system of growth that God has put in place. Don't try and cheat the system. When you hear Christians saying, we will do church online, I can do God by myself. Those people are misleading you. You won't find a, an isolated Christian. Never will you find. That person is, is they are on a high horse. It's just a matter of time. Very important. Be part of a spiritual community. Disciples. You can never be a disciple on your own. It's when you are part of a community. Every time the boys were together, you find them there in Jerusalem. You find them there. there. Even when they were sent, Paul and Barnabas, they were sent together. They were always doing things together. There was the unity of the faith. There were no individuals that were sent. So that is the real truth. Disciples. And that's our main goal. Find disciples. When you find someone, talk to them about Jesus. Right? Talk to them about Jesus. The main point, after you've led someone to Christ, take the responsibility of walking with them, journeying with them, being patient with them. That's why they took the fishermen. That's why they're there. Because they are patient. Over a long period of time. They made sh- make sure that that person has been incorporated into the church systems. The person is attending life group. The person is going. But if you see that you have tried. And they are not. Re- Jesus says. There is a term where Jesus says. You wash your what? And you leave. Dust your feet and you. Because they, that person is going to waste your time. That person is going to waste your time. You move on to the next person. That's how it works. 
find someone. There are always people around you that you can influence. But the problem is you, many a times, you are the one being influenced. You have to shift the scales and be the influence. How do you become an influence? Your light must show. People must know that you are a child of God. People must know that you are a minister of the gospel. You belong to a church. Once you do that, you start influencing them, loving on them, talking to them about Jesus. But many a times we spend more time talking about makeup, and then we will think, small, small, we'll talk about Jesus. No, 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 no. Primary, your conversations must be about Jesus. They must know this is the man of God. If I want problems, this is where I go. Doesn't mean you are not friendly, but when it comes to help, they must know that you are that source of help. You find that person, disciple them. Bring them to church. Send them our materials. Incorporate them in the community. Bring other people. That's what we are doing. You are doing stuff. Once you do that, man, if they are incorporated in the system, guess what? They are disciples. They are able to swim on themselves. What do you do? You go for the next one. Not just, let's bring 10 people. Guys, if I had to tell you how many evangelisms that I have done, They know in Bramfontein we had, we had a barbecue. You know a barbecue? <laughs> hey, imagine. You would, you would think someone singing for us, they would. <laughs> ah, ah, I've seen it all. I've done it all. We were wearing, I remember Brother G was there. He was wearing his cool shades, you know. He was looking. <laughs> He's wearing his cool shades, you know, he's, he's quite handsome, so he's like you use your handsome to, you know, to, <laughs> to lure, to bait some of these people. He's cool, you know, he's a cool, calm and collected guy wearing his shades. I said, Brother G, how is it going? <laughs> Just the height is well, which is well. <laughs> There's nothing you can do for those people. There's nothing you can do. Some people have rejected Jesus in their hearts. did everything that we would do. The only solution, I said, how? We, man, we did, I remember we did Rosebank. We walked along the Rosebank for hours expecting to get one soul. Brother Larry says, no, first of all, before you win, why don't you take time to pray for the souls? We took time. We were praying that week. We were praying that week for souls to say, Lord, if we meet souls, because Brother Lara was saying, no, we have to take over the territory first. You can't just go into a territory. You have to first pray. Let's take time. We were doing prayers. We're doing prayers. I remember in the basement, we went in the basement. We, went, we have to take over. Bramfontein belongs to us. In the name of you. <laughs> We couldn't even find one person, even with the ones with the hot dogs. They gave us their details. <laughs> when we tried to do follow-ups, they gave us wrong numbers. Oh, Imagine oh, the oh, nerve. <laughs> but you see, it's the journey of fishermen. Yeah. It's the journey of what? Yeah. It's the journey of a fisherman. We are fishing. Yeah. We will not stop. We are at Vitz, we are doing that. But we are also not ignorant. We don't waste our time yeah. on time wasters. Yeah. We invest our time on someone that we have seen there is a spark here. Yeah. Yes. They just don't get anything because they are trying to get fish because they're in the net. It's a drag net. It gets the crabs and whatever. Yeah. They're not going to put the, 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 the crabs and the octopuses in. They will throw them away because they are looking for specific what? Species. That's what they are looking for. So that's how we do it. As we grow, Vitz, they're going to be doing something at Vitz. Be part of it. Go out there and let's say, Lord, at least I was counted. At least you must have at least someone to tell you, dude, I don't need your church. To, at least be, be, be embarrassed. Or someone must shout at you for the sake of the gospel. You must feel something for this thing. You must experience some form of rejection for this gospel. To say, at least, Jesus, you know, I'm suffering for you. Some of you, you just want the Jesus where everything is fine. No! You need to go into those hard moments where the students are saying, I don't need your Jesus. I don't need anything to do with your cult. Who are you? What, what do you? You know, you, you need those things. They create strong convictions. 